So I just want to thank everybody who's already here right now. And I feel like traffic is crazy today, so that might be a part of the reason why we have some delays. But I would say it's time to start talking about this and having our presentations and doing the program. Um, because you have been here and waiting patiently, so I appreciate all of you for doing so. Um, I have a bunch of thanks, and then I'm going to set the stage of the exhibit that you're sitting in the middle of right now, and then do the, the heavy lifting of talking about the uh, four amazing presenters we have tonight. Um, but I want to thank the YWCA, San Francisco Marin, for helping me sort of vision this program and then helping really to sort of build this out and think about it, um, as well as, you know, all the other program speakers and panelists tonight who have been so gracious with their time and thoughts um, building this program. So I'm deeply appreciative of that. Um, and the reason why we've been doing all these programs related to deep topics that are really powerful and I think say a lot about every city in town in, in California and beyond um, is because of the exhibit you're sitting in the middle of right now, which is the Murals for Beldis exhibit, which is about eight mural stories of murals that were either painted over, censored, or destroyed. So as you walk around and the wall color changes, you're actually learning a lot about how these murals were made and then what happened to them. Um, so as you walk, gentrification plays a huge role in many of the murals' demises, whether it's changes in ownership of the building to lack of funds to preserve the murals that already exist. Even behind me right now, Ernesto de la Loza has done 48 murals in his time and only eight exist in Los Angeles right now. So mural loss is a huge part of sort of the LA story as well as his preservation. And in San Francisco, I feel like there's no more powerful topic, maybe homelessness to gentrification. And obviously those two things play into each other as well. So I thought what a better way to think about this exhibit than to think about it in the context of this topic and to allow our space to be a venue to have that conversation, to think about it, and then to build resources. So whatever you choose to do next, um, we help you kind of get there. So whether it's going to a workshop or going out to the mission or helping to paint a mural or reading a book or what have you, we want to help provide those resources. So you can see that there's a resource list that's on each of your chairs that has a starter pack of resources, but then tonight each of the panelists will also provide some as well. And then you can add your own during the roundtable discussion portion. So when the many hordes come for this program and they sit with you, each of the speakers are actually gonna break out into the round table, they'll come to your table and they'll talk about a question that's actually in the little cups on your tables um, and they're broad questions for you all to discuss as a group. And I feel like there's no better way to talk about sometimes complicated pro topics like these than to do it together in a group and see where each person is coming from. So um, I appreciate people doing that. And then afterwards, the solve is seeing the exhibit and then having another glass of wine or beer. So um, you get to enjoy that as well after the round table. So it's really about discussion, building those resources, and learning about these amazing people and organizations that I think um, add a lot to this conversation. So, you know, keep your questions and thoughts, you know, for the round table, you know, allow a lot of the conversation to sort of seep in um, and just, you know, enjoy, enjoy each of the people that are presenting today. And so I'm going to introduce them based on their presentation. So I'm going to introduce Laura Eberly first, who's the Director of Social Change, which leads the YWCA San Francisco Marines Advocacy and Racial Justice Efforts through local and statewide campaigns serving the YWCA's mission of eliminating racism and empowering women. She comes to this role from extensive community organizing and leadership development experience and a fierce personal commitment to racial and gender justice. Laura also co-facilitates the Inclusion Inventory, the WISE unique consulting program to transform organizations and individuals focus on diversity into true inclusion. I checked them out online. They do amazing programs and work. Um, Corey's in the audience right now, and I have to thank her for being so amazing and helping me with this event. Um, and they really host amazing events. Hopefully, we'll do more with them. So that's the hope. Um, the second person that's going to be speaking is Carla Wojcik, but she's going to be speaking on behalf of the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project. And I'll just say a little bit about who they are right now. Um, it's a data visualization, data analysis, and storytelling collective documenting the dispossession of San Francisco's Bay Area residents upon gentrifying landscapes. Through digital maps, oral history, work, film, and community events, the project renders connections between the nodes and effects of new entanglements of global capital, real estate, high tech, and political economy. It studies the displacement of people, but also complex social worlds as a certain spaces become desirable to such entanglements. Maintaining anti-racist and feminist analysis, as well as decolonizing methodologies, the project creates tools and disseminates data that con contributes to collective resistance and movement building. Amazing website. Carla's gonna show you a bunch of pages from that website, as well as how it connects to muralism. 
Um, and I really thank Carlo for being a great advisor to CHS, a great thinker, um, and just a great supporter. So I thank you for that. Um, Carlos Gonzalez, Carlos Kuki Gonzalez, uh, has been drawing and painting since childhood. Most of his art reflects the phases of life he experienced growing up in San Francisco's barrio, uh, the Mission District. He'll talk a lot about his story and how he got here tonight, but he's a really powerful muralist. You might, might know him from some of the 24th Street murals, including the one at BART, um, and he'll talk about one that is in the process of possibly being displaced and destroyed this evening, but um, he has a really powerful website as well that I would suggest checking out of his work. Um, and his story is an amazing one, and I'm gonna leave it to Carlos to tell, because if I tell it now, then what will you talk about, Carlos? So, um, but know that his story really leads him to muralism in a really interesting way. Um, and part of that has to do with things like the way the juvenile system works and, and how it kind of led him to muralism. So I'm very grateful for him for being here tonight, so thank you. Tomas Riley comes to us, uh, so I thank him for that. Um, he brings nearly 20 years of leadership work in community engagement and education through California and across the country. Since returning to San Francisco, he has worked as a bilingual classroom teacher and developed literacy programs throughout the Bay Area for leading spoken work organizations, Youth Speaks, which we love, so go Youth Speaks. As executive director of Arts Change, Tomas worked with young people in the East Bay, cities of Richmond, to create the youth-centered arts engagement um, opportunities for teens. And most recently, he served as Director of Experience and Community Engagement for the Children's Creativity Museum of San Francisco. And he's also served as the Executive Director for Counterpulse, an arts organization of the Tenderloin, and currently works in development for San Francisco's Family Resource Center. Additionally, Tomas is a founding member of the seminal Chicano Spoken Word Collective, the Taco Shop Poets, and the author of two collections of poetry. In 2014, Tomas and his family fought and won an owner move-in eviction attempt for the apartment that they were lived in for nearly 20 years. He thankfully still lives and works and writes the mission, and he'll talk about that story tonight and, and how they fought that eviction. So, I'm gonna head over to Laura, and she's gonna present first. I'm really excited for that. I'm gonna put the mic back where it belongs. And uh, we're going to start the show. So I thank everybody for being here. I thank you for your support tonight. And uh, thank you for being a part of this important conversation. Hi. How's everybody doing? Um, I'm going to invite you. you if you want to sit by yourselves, you're welcome to. But I want to invite you to get up and sit with other people. Everybody's happy where they are. OK. Just wanted to open the opportunity. OK. Um, so we're here tonight to talk about gentrification. Um, I am from the YWCA, uh, as Patty said, and we do a bunch of different things. But we're primarily a social justice organization, right? And we've been in the Bay Area since 1878. And for that entire time, we've done a couple of different things. We have always provided direct social services to people in need. Um, and we have also been doing policy advocacy and grassroots organizing to change the material conditions of the folks that we serve. Right, working with and in communities to try and build the more inclusive and more equitable world that we all want to be part of. Our mission is eliminating racism and empowering women. Um, and the ways that we do that currently, as Carla said, we do um, direct racial justice work. We have a consulting program where we work with organizations. Uh, and for the reason that, one of the reasons that we're here tonight is that we're also an affordable housing provider. Um, so we come at this kind of from both ends of things, of thinking about how do we make sure that people are housed who need housing right now, but also how do we change the conversation around housing and race and class and the ways that all of those things intersect. I want to start just really personally with the experience of the folks in the room and take a minute to think about how you answer the question, where are you from? Some folks, that's a really straightforward question. For some people, it's really complicated. And for lots of people, it gets more complicated as you go throughout your life, right? Take a second and think about your answer. And then turn to your neighbor and just let them know where you're from. We start here because most of us have a couple of answers, right? Um, and these are mine. So I grew up in New Hampshire in a really tiny little town, 4,000 people, no stoplights. Uh, that's where home is. That's where my family still is. Uh, and then I moved to Chicago for college and stuck around. The city really got its roots into me, and I lived there for 10 years. And that was where I became a community organizer um, and really worked deeply with a number of organizations. And then I moved out here to the Bay Area about three years ago uh, for my wife's job. She got a dream job opportunity, and we couldn't not come. Uh, and so that's where we are now. We live over in Oakland, and I work in San Francisco and Marin. So I'm across a different bridge on a day-to-day -day basis. 
This is just to ground us in, you have access to different things when you're in different places. Right? We sort of take for granted that that's true. We don't always think about it. That where you have access to the housing that you need might be really different from where you can get the work that you want to do, might be really different from where your people are. But in all of these circumstances, place is really important. Right? Place is really central to all these aspects of our identities. And being able to live where we need to live to make all of these things come together should be thought of as really central to being human. Right? Just the basic ability to live with your people and where your work and your education are. Right? Another thing we take for granted is that neighborhoods can look really different. I'm going to show you images of two different neighborhoods in Chicago where I organized. So this is a neighborhood on the north side uh, called Wicker Park. And you can see sort of what the transit and the housing options in that neighborhood look like, what the restaurants and the shopping opportunities are. And you can already start to imagine some of what life is like in this neighborhood. You can imagine what the job opportunities are, where people go to school, and maybe you can imagine who lives here, what kind of people. And this is a neighborhood that I organized in on the south side called Englewood. And you can see what the housing and the transit look like here. And you can also start to imagine what education looks like in this neighborhood, what kinds of job opportunities are available. And if you're making assumptions about who lives in these neighborhoods, you're also probably right. The Wicker Park is about 70% white and very affluent. And Englewood at the last census was 98% black and also 90% below the federal poverty line. And you can go into any city in this country and find neighborhoods that look like these two places. And you can also make assumptions about where white people live and where people of color live. You can usually be right. Because we have tied race, class, and place really intimately together in this country in some really systemic ways. There's not one single reason for why we got here, but I'm going to talk about one single reason that's really, really powerful. Uh, so that we can know a little bit more about how that history influences us still today. Anybody know where these maps come from? Anyone seen these before? What, you, what are they? They're red line maps from the Federal Housing Authority. Yeah, FHA, the Federal Housing Authority. Uh, do you know kind of what timeline, what era these are from? 1930s. 1930s and 40s. I think these particular maps were made in 39. Yep. And why did the Federal Housing Administration create these? To codify segregation. Yep. So these maps were not uh, technically supposed to be maps of the racial makeup of these areas. What they were was the federal government lining, outlining where they would and would not back home loans. So the red areas were, were designated as areas where the federal government wouldn't back a home loan because they were too high risk. Yellow areas were unlikely to get federally backed home loans because they were relatively high risk. And blue and green areas were deemed low risk, good investments, and the federal government would back a home loan in those areas. And they made determinations about what color an area would be based on who already lived there. This is also a time where you have restrictive covenants in a lot of places. You have neighborhoods that are available to white people only um, and that have restrictive deeds and agreements among them that they won't sell to anyone who's a person of color. What this also means is that housing demand in communities of color is very high at this time. There's not enough housing stock in most American cities in the neighborhoods that belong to people of color. Um, and so rents are really high because that's how demand works, right? And so you find people paying two and three times rent uh, for the same quality housing stock that you would be paying for in a white neighborhood. This means something that we're all pretty familiar with now in the Bay Area, right? If you're paying really high rent, what can't you do? Anything else but pay your rent. And specifically, you can't save for a down payment to eventually buy your own home. Even if there were property that were available to you to purchase as a person of color, you're paying two and three times the rent that a white renter is paying. And so it's that much harder to get ahead, build up a down payment, and eventually purchase your own home. The other thing that's happening nationally in the 30s and 40s when these maps get created is that you're starting to see the very beginning of that American dream of a nuclear family owning their own home. 
prior to the 30s and 40s, right, that wasn't really an expectation that we had universally in this country, that people would own a single family home. So this is also when the first suburbs start getting built. And when that assumption starts being inscribed in our collective economy, that the way that you're going to save, the way that you're going to invest, and the way that you're going to build wealth for your family long term is through the purchase of a single family home. Right at the moment that that assumption is getting set up and that our economy is getting designated in that way, people of color are explicitly locked out from that investment. That's true. Why people of color are being locked out, and so are many others, too, including white, many white people. White people at this time, when these maps are created, were not legally locked out of these places in the same way that covenants were written to lock out people of color explicitly. It doesn't mean that every white person had the financial means to access this benefit, but they weren't pro, uh, prescribed from it in the same way. So another thing that you have happening in this time frame, right, is the GI Bill. So both of my grandfathers were white and fought in World War II, and they both came home and benefited from the GI Bill and bought their first home with a federally backed loan through the GI Bill. And those homes are where my parents were raised, and then those homes were used to finance uh, my parents both going to college and graduating without debt. So that when they got married, they were able to purchase a home pretty rapidly that they raised me and my brother in and then used to finance our college education. So a benefit available to white folks, really important to my family that I have benefited from, that people of color were explicitly locked out of. Only one of the ways in which these maps were really, really powerful and reinscribed this uh, connection between race, place, and class in a way that makes it still endure to today. So you get to the 2010 census, 70 years after that map was created, and you can see that the map still looks really similar. So if you can't read it, uh, these dots, each dot is for a person, right? And the blue dots are where white people live, the green dots are where black folks live. Uh, the red dots are for Asians, and the orange-yellow dots are for Hispanics. These maps are 70 years apart, and they still are really, really similar. Those red-lined places are still areas where black people largely live. Um, Hispanic and Asian people tend to live more in those mid-risk yellow areas, and white people still live in the high uh, high investment areas that are green and blue. This is how many housing, uh, this is how many households are housing burdened by race in San Francisco. So this means how many people are paying too much of their income towards their rent among renters. Only 37% of white folks, 54% of black folks, and 52% of Latinos. This is 2015. I think we all kind of have a sense of this, right? There are lots of institutions, and there are lots of different ways of cutting these numbers, right? I can show you home ownership by race. Again, white people much more likely in the Bay Area to own than black and Latino folks. Um, home ownership for Asians looks like it's doing really well, but we can trouble that number some, right? We know that Asian is a really, really broad category, and some folks in that category are doing really well, and some are doing very poorly. What does it translate to? It translates to people of color also living in really high poverty neighborhoods. So nationally, uh, black families with a household income of about 100,000 tend to live in neighborhoods that look like what a white household earning 30,000 would live in. So you're more likely to live in a high poverty neighborhood regardless of your income if you're a person of color than if you're white. And in the Bay Area, black folks are three and a half more times Three and a half times more likely to live in a high poverty neighborhood than white folks. And so what else does that mean? Right? That means property taxes. That means you're more likely to be in a high poverty school district if you live in a high poverty neighborhood. You see the majority of white kids in SF are in low poverty schools. The majority of black and Latino kids are in mid-high or high poverty level schools. It also translates into income. All of that combined translates into a massive wealth gap. We have white families have about seven times the wealth of average black families and five times the wealth of average Hispanic families.
banks are a major part of it. These are the 12 major banks that provide home loans in Oakland. And in 2015, here's who they gave home loans to. Every single one of them gave loans at a way higher rate to white uh, applicants than to Asian, Latino, or African American applicants. And here's a third map for you. This is a heat map of where Wells Fargo provided home loans in 2015. just digging this deeper, right? The FHA created these maps and we dig it deeper and deeper and deeper every year with every generation. And we're still doing it. We need to talk about where it came from. Right? If we're gonna learn anything about how could we do differently now. Um, and we often talk about the history here as a history of interpersonal racial prejudice and bias, right? There were some really, really racist white folks in the 30s and 40s who set up these biased racial covenants and said, we don't want any people of color living here. Um, and that got written into our institutions in a number of ways. Stereotypes were part of this, right? And it's the same stereotypes and prejudices that have used, been used against people of color by white supremacy throughout our country's entire history, right? So used against Native Americans during colonization used against Chinese immigrants when they first came here, used against Mexican immigrants and Latino immigrants still today. Uh, stereotypes that people of color are one, lazy and not very smart. And on the other hand, very, very cunning and here to take our jobs. The total catch-22, but the same messaging that always gets used to reinscribe bias against people of color. The bias was out and in the world when the FHA created those maps. It's still out and in the world today. But I want us to think a little more critically about how it gets used and by whom. It wasn't just that there were red, line covenant, uh, red lines and neighborhood covenants excuse me, in the 30s and 40s. But people were actively using that bias to make a lot of money. So did any, has anybody heard of the um, phenomenon of blockbusting that happened during that time? Yeah. Do you want to say something about what it was? Well, it's basically kind of like redlining. They had certain areas that they, they would uh, you know, lend very high rate interest loans or not lend at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was a piece of it. It's yeah. not a whole yeah. thing. When a black person came into a neighborhood, Neighborhoods flipped really, really fast. And one of the reasons that happened was because real estate speculators figured out they could make bank. And what they would do is they would go into a neighborhood where one family of color had moved in or had even expressed interest in buying a place, and they would literally go door to door, and they would knock on people's homes and say, hey, have you seen what's about to happen in your neighborhood? Your housing, your property value is about to tank. Don't you want to sell to me right now? There were even cases of real estate speculators uh, being documented having hired people of color to just walk around the neighborhood and pose as trying to buy a place in order to light people's fear on fire, right? So they would buy up these properties at fire sale prices and then sell at exorbitant rates to families of color. People were making money off of it. Right? And this is something that we totally still see happening, right? That there's bias out in the world and people in power have figured out how to leverage it in order to make more money for themselves. Does that sound familiar to anyone right now? We want to think about this piece of it when we think about gentrification, right? We want to think about who is being leveraged against each other. And we're actually in this interesting moment, right, where every single person in the Bay Area who you talk to will reaffirm that there's a housing crisis. Everybody who doesn't already own their home feels pinched, including a whole bunch of white folks who in other parts of the country would probably be doing fine. And we have a unique opportunity to reorient people's interests, to 
where they actually lie. But to do that, we have to be really, really critical, particularly of the ways that gentrification causes additional policing of people of color, and especially of people of color who have been here forever. Right? So we're here in the mission where Alex Nieto was killed because people called the police on him right? as someone who maybe didn't belong in the neighborhood that he was from. It has lethal consequences we allow people to gentrify, when we allow people to move in, and when we don't know how to say no to money. We have a unique opportunity here where we can ask people, what are they being asked to make room for? Right? If you're getting forced out of a neighborhood, or if you're forcing someone else out of a neighborhood, who's coming in behind them? And who are you making space for? It's not for you. Right? It's for people much, much more powerful, who have a lot more money, and who don't necessarily have racial animus as their actual goal. They're using racial animus to make money for themselves. So, fortunately, I get to just be here and talk about the problem. We have a couple of folks who are gonna talk about the solutions and some of the active resistance that's happening now to take this history and re-encounter it in a really different kind of way. Better now. Thanks. My name's Carla, and I'm going to start my timer. Um, I moved here in 2009. I grew up at the base of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. My parents met here, and so I had a uh, see about this place and um, let me try to bring up an image so that you're not looking at this thing my thing got moved around and there was another thing oh there it is Um, yeah, so my parent, my dad was from Crown Heights, New York, um, his mom from Poland, and my mom was from Montana, Great Falls, Montana, and her family from uh, Norway, and they met in the Bay, fell in love, and they followed the poetry trail, ended up in Colorado, where I was born. And I, I wasn't expecting to come. I was actually on the other side of the coast um, for a while. And I had a roommate who became one of my best friends. And we would spend time kind of scheming up what we wanted to do sometime if we ever, if you got a grant to do anything that you could do possibly in the world, what would it be? And we would sit down at the kitchen table and like map things out. And it was things very specific, like all art everywhere with everyone. <laughs> Literally, that's what we, you know, and, and storytelling, and we could involve this and that art, and I thought, ooh, like theater involves all those things, and we were going to get a van and travel around the country and just tell stories with everyone and make art and that. Um, strangely enough, the next day after we were doing this, I had an opportunity to work at a community theater. I'd never done theater before, but I got a cold call from somebody, and my friend got an opportunity to come to San Francisco. And we were gonna come across the country, that was our plan, come across the country and come to San Francisco. Um, so we had to part ways for a while because I got a job and she got the opportunity to come to San Francisco. Um, that friend is, was the, became the f strange organic founder of this thing called the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project, which does, um, what data visualization, oral histories. Um, and I ended up here and doing lots of community organizing and art murals, um, fell in love with the murals. And also um, giving tours about the murals, learning a lot of the history of the murals and telling those stories. So, um, and then I also you know, got involved with the anti-eviction mapping project after Aaron started this 
And so all, one day we looked at each other and we were like, oh my God, we're doing this thing that we said we were going to do. But we, it didn't look, we had to realize that it didn't look like the thing that we thought it was going to look like. But here we are. Um, I'm not involved with the data visualization part of the anti-eviction mapping project, so um, I'm not su uh, super... I know more of the oral history and the humanities side of this, so I'm kind of going to be doing this with you. Um, and a lot of this overlaps with Laura's presentation, so I'm going to go quickly through those parts and get more to the parts that um, don't. But I just wanted to start with this. Um, a friend just sent this to me. Six things data visualization can learn from feminism. And she cited the anti-eviction mapping project. Um, this is one of our community power maps. And she cited us in number two, embrace pluralism. Objectivity is stronger when there are multiple, multiple perspectives on the table. And so she talks about how the anti-eviction mapping project is a very porous, we're a collective, we're not an organization, we're completely amorphous and porous, um, and we just do things based on, you know, what someone wants to map, or there's a grassroots organization that's pushing for something, and so we're, you know, we collect data and stories about it, or there's, um, uh, mural that needs to be painted about no-fault eviction, so we do it, you know. So it's just many different things that we do, many different people at many different times. So she, she pointed to the anti-eviction mapping project in San Francisco, an ongoing project mapping the housing crisis in the Bay, Bay City, with no singular, quote, big viewpoint, visualization, and more, um, no, this is what I want to get to. Their website is not only about the output, she said, but it's also about the collective organizing and movement building and teaching people along the way. So she also says that our, our, um, our website is messy, but that's the point. <laughs> so that was just a disclaimer. Our website is very messy. It has a million and one different maps on it and different things. Um, and so it's quite a, a ride if you want to uh, explore it. Um, but I'm just going to kind of follow. It's all, as Laura was kind of pointing out, all this stuff, there's many entanglements in this one overarching word of gentrification. There's so many entanglements. So I'm basically just going to try to follow one thread and get tangled up and then go some, follow the other thread and try to follow a line through here. Laura was talking about uh, redlining, and um, one of our maps talks about um, something that we learned recently about First Republic Bank. And uh, we were looking at serial evictors and doing some research about um, those serial evictors. And what we found out was many of those serial evictors were getting loans from First Republic Bank. So um, when you come down to this map of Oakland, um, let's see if I can make this bigger. It's really hard to see on this monitor. Um, but I'll move it in a second. Uh, first, the first layer of the map is just uh, where First Republic Bank has given loans. And then the second map, if you overlay it, you can overlay it with a map of historic redlining in Oakland. You'd think that First Republic Bank is giving loans to a lot of low-income people in Oakland, <laughs> but they're actually giving loans to serial evictors. So they're, they're giving loans for people to displace people. There's just another layer of that story. So just as a segue into this presentation, I just wanted to show that. Um, there's a protest happening for, against this um, coming up really soon. So keep an eye out for it. Um, and just to say a lot of this uh, presentation will be a, 
not only about the gentrification, but also different examples of resistance to that. So this particular thing was a, a collaboration with the California Reinvestment Coalition, which looks at banks and fair lending practices. So that's why this map came about. One of my uh, people at the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project wanted me to talk a lot about, she's about the um, loss of public space, because um, that, that also has a lot to do with um, surveillance, policing, gentrification. Do you folks know the, the, this thing about Mission Playground that happened? Um, in 2006, a deal was sealed between the city and county of San Francisco. And the city, I don't know how to work this on this computer. There we go. Yeah, this is a soccer field thing. Yeah. Um, there we go. 2006, a deal was sealed between the city and county of San Francisco and the City Fields Foundation, granting um, the use of public lands for a series of construction projects. Um, basically, they started, it was a marriage between public land and privatization. Um, so, they, in, in this whole process, they changed their policies so that you could um, basically get a permit to play on this playground that was historically just, it was a community playground. People played soccer on it all the time. Um, so, um, yeah. do you have a question? Uh huh, right. 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 But if I had a time to read, you should go on to the anti eviction mapping project and read this story because if I had a time. Yeah. It says. Um, what you're saying is, is actually similar to what, so it's saying Parks and Recreation changed the permitting policy after this video that I'm about to show you went viral. But they co-opted the incident to state that it was indicative of resource shortage rather than the reality that city employees are doling out public resources to wealthy, the wealthy at the expense of the rest. Yeah, we have a seven good? Really? Yeah. Yo, there is no seven to eight. Anything. If you want to play pickup, you play pickup like the rest of us. It's not pickup. You, you, you can book the fucking field. field. You, you can book the field. field. Just because you got money, you can pay for the field. You don't get to book it for an hour to take over these kids' fucking lives. It's kind of bullshit. No, it's bullshit. No, it's bullshit. My favorite part of this is when he asks, will you show me your paper? Let me see your paper. Well, the kid asks, show me your paper. I don't have it. Connor has it. Who's Connor? So if he comes, then you guys can get the field. You got a permit? Let me see your permit. Let me see your permit. Hey, it's Connor. Hey, let me see. No, no, no. I mean, if he was coming, I'm pretty sure he'd be here at 7 to 8. <laughs> yeah, he'd be here 7 to 8. I'm pretty sure he'd be here 7 to 8. He's not there. <laughs> yeah, so, because I don't, I don't know when, you know what I mean? So, can you ask? Let me see your paper. Let me see your paper. So then the guy comes. The guy comes. This is, I'm showing this because it is an example of sort of. They held their ground on this, right? So this guy comes with the Show paper. He's trying to get them to go off the field to view the paper. So that they yeah, yeah. You guys, you guys understand this? Like it's pretty simple, man. 
We paid twenty seven dollars to serve the field for now. We paid twenty seven dollars to serve the field. I know how to read it. Okay. I'm an educated up? person. I'm, I'm also I'm also know that this field has always been a picture where you play seven percent of the way you're And you guys, and you guys think that just because you have money, you can buy the field Here we go. and play and take over the field where you're seven percent. I don't care about this. You can do it. I don't need this. It's really awkward and weird. Like we're part of the community and we're trying to play. I want to play. It's really weird, man. How am I being weird? I'm just disastrously weird. What are you talking about? Okay, I'm going to end that. You're being awkward and disastrously weird. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Hard to watch. So. <laughs> other, other, um, other manifestations of this are tech bus stops, right? We know, have, has, there was a recent tech bus stoppage. I don't know if, with the scooters, yeah. Tech, there was a recent tech bus stoppage. So why are people stopping the tech bus? Um, the Daily Show guy, I forget his name, made a joke about us a couple years ago, them, whoever stopped those tech buses. And uh, he got it wrong, he like made fun of us. He's like, why are they stopping the tech buses? The people are just trying to get to work. But, well, so why are, why are they stopping the tech buses? Um, the tech buses have, are shuttles. It's great. It's we're we're clogging the you know. There's tons of traffic. Isn't it good that we have a tech that we have these shuttles taking people to Mountain View or wherever? Well, um, this map kind of shows us a little bit more about that, which is that uh, there's basically bullseyes around these where the buses stop. So they stop at public bus stops. If if I, as an individual, were to stop at a public bus stop um, and get caught, I think I'd have to pay like two hundred and seventy something dollars, you know, as a ticket. But these buses were stopping and picking up hordes of people without paying into the public infrastructure. Um, and we can see in this map in Bullseyes, uh, sixty-nine percent of no-fault evictions, meaning not the fault of the people who got evicted each year occur within four blocks of these known shuttle bus stops. And there's other maps that also show that rent increases are higher around these bus stops because it's more convenient for people to get on the tech buses. And I'd mentioned no fault evictions. Uh, that's, those are the loopholes that um, landlords can use to get around to actually legally evict people, even though we pretend to have very strong rent control here in the city. There's things such as Ellis Act evictions, owner move-ins, demolition evictions, etc. So this uh, is a map that shows that over time. It kind of looks like something's being bombed. I'm not going to show it right now. Um, one small act of resistance to this was a mural we put up in Clarion Alley, which was at the, basically Clarion Alley is at the confluence of, um, you know, at Ground Zero of Gentrification, it's on Clarion and Valencia. And we put up a map that was an oral history map where people told their stories um, of fighting their evictions. Uh, everyone on this map, on the, um, and then we had a map of the no-fault evictions in the middle. Everyone in, on this mural, strangely enough, won their eviction case. Like, so... It was sort of a testament to if you fight, you win. Uh, there's one person on this map, on this mural that did not win his eviction case, and that was Alex Nieto, who's right here. We put him there because it's right across the street from the, the, um, SF, the police station, and he was permanently evicted, and Laura, Laura talked about that. Increased sort of hyper-surveillance and hyper-policing. This was a really beautiful moment. We had the mural opening. And I'm not sure. Hello, everybody. My name is Adriana Camarena. 
I'm lighting our little candle of hope here with Oscar Salinas. Might not last because of the wind. Can all the people who are, who are in the mural come up? Please? Who are depicted in the mural? See, sí, entonces este, depicted in the mural. So you're you're all here, and I know that the nietos were picking out Alex's headstone right now. That's why they they may they could or could not come here. We've been fighting a long time. Uh, thank everybody for their help, and it's more than you know. It's more than just marching down the street. This is emotional and mental. Uh, support and help that's it's invaluable. Living here in a mission, I love it. I mean, I lived here all my life. I was born and raised at Presida Park. I was born at General Hospital. When I first looked out and saw 150 strangers in front of my landlord's office, I was just almost moved to tears because it was so beautiful. I really think that uh, the best part of this horrible experience was meeting all these nice people and you know and, and hearing some really encouraging words and and even having in hindsight is uh, a lot of fun in those confrontations in hindsight <laughs> during it is kind of a little something a little hairy anybody that moved into the neighborhood would come up to somebody and say hey welcome to the neighborhood bring a little bit of pancito a little bit of food and just welcome everybody to the neighborhood and I don't see that anymore. I met everybody on this mural when they so, were... So, anyway, uh, this is on our, on our website. If, uh, it's a really moving thing because it's showing really the power of people organizing together. So even though this is happening, displacement is happening with epidemic proportions, um, the resistance to that can be really beautiful. Um, Laura spoke about the um, how gentrification has can have uh, deathly consequences. I guess it can also have slow deathly consequences, but it can also have immediate deathly consequences. And we we have some we have data that we've collected around that. We got, got like asked for information from the police department. Got like a list of things. So one of our collective members went and researched all the different articles related to these police killings and then mapped, mapped them. And unfortunately, we continue to map them, but also um, in the last couple months, some beautiful murals have gone up to commemorate um, folks who have been killed by the police. This is um, Luis Gongoro Pat. And I'll show you a picture of that mural uh, in Clarion Alley in a minute. And uh, we're currently in the process of uh, creating a mural uh, for memorializing uh, Amilcar Perez Lopez. Let's see. Uh, as we're trying to secure a wall for this mural, I'm going to ask actually for your help because we. We work, we're working for, with the Justice for a Milk Car Coalition, and we're working with HOMI, which is a youth organization. Um, we finally got funding for this mural to memorialize a milk car, and we're looking for a wall. I think the wall that we were fighting to get probably fell through, and I'm going to tell you the story of that because it ha this is the last story I'll tell. Um, this has to do with whitewashing of murals, which is what the show is kind of pointing to. Um, so the whitewashed mural reveals the role of street or blah, blah, blah. Um, this happened, I'm going to get rid of this and just do this via photos. It'll look better. How do I do it? Five windows, people. Thank you. Uh, this is the mural in Clarion Alley that was for Luis. The Virgin is looking toward the police station. They made the Virgin look much more Mayan. That's um, Luis's roots. It has sort of a, a story of his life and death around there. This was um, Elaine Chu and um, Marina Perez Wong just painted this. So this is um, 
Alma, it's now Alma Restaurant, but it's a building on, 20, on Folsom and 24th. Uh, this restaurant just went in. Um, the building was just uh, bought by a new owner. Um, one day, as I give, I give mural tours, and I don't usually go this far, but I ended up coming this way for God knows what reason. And I saw um, somebody about to whitewash a mural. And I was like, whoa, you, hold on, hold on, hold on. You might not want to do that. There was a number of people in the neighborhood that came by and said the same thing. They, you know, warned them, asked them, told them, you know, you, you might want to rethink this. That's not the etiquette of the, of the neighborhood. I'm sure you don't have permission to do that. The mural was... Um, image that was put on the other side, on the 24th Street side of the building, by uh, Presida Eyes Urban Youth Arts Program. It was, um, do I have it? That's why I had this other thing. Yeah, no, the old one was actually uh, this image of a skull with the background. It said, our culture cannot be bought. This is a you know, traditional Day of the Dead skull that our culture cannot be bought. The new owner, and I quote, said this, this mural looked too dark and he wanted something more, something brighter. Um, and so he hired someone from, it was an artist from Denver, and she uh, made a design for this wall and she, you know, she, she wasn't intending to hurt anybody's feelings or whitewash a wall. She thought she had permission, but she also was coming from outside and didn't, you know, she, um, was just excited to paint in the Mission District. And um, she was, you know, hashtag Lululemon. That was like all of her things. Hashtag, I think she was maybe being uh, sponsored by them or something. And she had created a, a paisley design um, for the wall that um, had a message, be a good person. That was the message. So she had this design, which to me is just so... In it speaks to San Francisco. It's very progressive in this, like, kind of, you know, politicized positivity about things. Um, anyway, they, they didn't listen to the five or six people that warned them not to paint out the wall, and so um, they did. They got F5. They got um, about three-quarters of the way through. This is after they'd whitewashed it a couple days later. We have some messages on there. <laughs> um, okay. And this is the, another view. This, so this is as far as they got before there was an intervention, literally. And I wish we had kind of been more forceful initially, but lit, like there was a convergence upon these people. And that was a lot of the youth that had painted the mural. It was the local newspapers, El Tecolote, the Mission Local, and a bunch of neighbors and people stopped them. And there was a huge to-do. The owner had to come out. He f ended up having to like enter into dialogue with Presida Eyes. He eventually gave the wall back. He did not pay any money to get a new mural, but he, at least he gave the wall back. And Presida Eyes painted a new mural on the wall, La Cultura Cura. Um, and it was based off of Lotaria cards. There's Puro Burrito, or Puro Barrio, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> uh, La Tristeza. A low rider, por vida, la fuerza, el movimiento, and la mano. And then um, we fought really hard to get the wall next to it so that um, we could add another mural, and that mural went up, is in the process of going up. It's a mural with mission girls. Um, so they apologized to this nice woman. They asked her to go around to the We'll give you the wall on the other side. So she got the Folsom Street wall, and she went about painting her mural. This is, it's going up. You can see it at the bottom. It says, be a good person. She's creating her Paisley design. This has become like an insider hashtag, be a good person. <laughs> um, so there it is. And that lasted a week, maybe a couple days, before it got probably not even a night, maybe not even 24 hours before it got totally hit up. Carlos, is that yours right there? No, I'm just kidding. Um, and it was eventually painted 
back gray. Uh, this happens to be right down the street from where Milkar was killed, literally just a couple doors down. So we were really pushing to try to get um, a mural of a Milkar for a Milkar up. We did a preliminary design. This is a very bare bones. Um, and then I did about four workshops with Homey Youth to um, infuse the design more. Uh, we had a community meeting where people came and put up put suggestions. Um, this has been a process over a year long. We finally got funding to do the mural, so the funding is there. We're just looking for the wall. That's what I'm, that's what I'm asking for your help. But, so we had a little altar we put up. Um, we had originally, we really wanted this wall now that they've painted it out gray again. Uh, the problem is, and it's interesting because one of the owners of Alma was actually a friend of Amilcar's, so he seemed very moved when I told him about the project, although I think he's caught between two worlds because he's the owner of this restaurant. They want to put outdoor seating. I'm not sure what it would be like for people. I think it would be the best photograph ever, but people eating in front of <laughs> this uh, memorial mural, it just I'm not sure it's actually going to fly with them. Uh, we've been trying different ideas of having the decorative parts on the bottom and having the more of the content on top. Um, but it, it may, at the end of the day, you want to paint a mural where the mural is welcomed. So I don't want to put the youth through having to paint a mural in an environment that, there's a lot of reasons why we want this mural. It's the be a good person wall. And it's right down the street from where Milkar was killed. And it's across the street from Phil's, which is where I get coffee, but also where a lot of the um, police force get coffee. So they would be drinking their coffee and looking at a very clear sign that would be um, asking them to cease fire. So I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, the Carlos Gonzalez is going to speak next. He's going to talk a little bit about himself and then about this mural that I just popped up. All right. Well, all this has gotten me pissed off, man. I swear. All this tech and greed just has taken over. Um, my name is Carlos. Everybody knows me in the neighborhood as Kuki Gonzalez. I was born and raised in the mission. My parents immigrated from Mexico in the 50s. And uh, my family, my sisters, I'm the youngest of four. Uh, I'm the only boy, I have three big sisters, and I was the only one born here. And uh, growing up in the mission as a kid in elementary school in the 60s, uh, mostly Latino kids. It was a cultural enclave for a long time for Latino families. They had everything they needed in the mission that they had back home. Um, panaderias, carniceria, mercado, everything. Spanish radio stations, Spanish newspapers. It was really cool. And growing up in the mission, um, it was mostly Latino kids. And I went to Catholic school, a little Catholic school called St. Charles on 18th and Shotwell. And uh, it was a motley crew of mostly Latino kids, uh, working class Irish, working class Italian, a little sprinkle of black kids in the neighborhood. But man, we all hung out and the mission was our Camelot every alley, every fence, every street, every rooftop. And we had fun. Uh, we had a great time. I grew up on the streets um, in the 60s and um, kind of got caught up, got into trouble as a teenager in the 70s, um, got involved with drugs and gangs, and um, wound up in juvie. And as a result of being put on probation at that time in the mission in the late 60s, early 70s, there was a cultural explosion of music, Santana, Malo, uh, lots of salsa. I mean, uh, music was in the air. Um, culture was everywhere. Um, art, music, the end of the hippie movement, the civil rights movement, um, all kinds of movimientos. I was politicized. I watched the Vietnam War on TV as a kid. Um, there was a lot of activism. San Francisco, uh, growing up in the mission, uh, I had the, the good fortune of having uh, the benefit of a lot of community agencies that organized to protect youth in the community. Um, as a result of my delinquency, um, I was put on probation and um, I was relegated to work with muralists as part of my community service. That was a punishment. <laughs> so, um, 
what wound up happening is I wound up uh, taking, taking to art. And I was always an artist as a kid. I remember my father coming home from work, and instead of having homework for him, he'd expect a drawing. And I'd have it right at 4.30 when he got home from work. And I'd come home at 3, start drawing, whatever I could think of. And um, he'd look at it and goes, all right, go outside and play. Didn't even care about homework, just have a drawing for him. And throughout my life, my mom saved all my drawings. As I got older, in the different phases of my life, as a kid, well, it was all sports figures. Willie Mays, Willie McCovey, the Giants, 49ers. As I got a little bit older and started experimenting with drugs, things got a little more psychedelic. My drawings and paintings, colorful, and things melting and stuff. Got into girls, I started painting nudes and stuff. So all the different phases of my life um, were reflected in my art at whatever age I was at. My mom saved them. Um, somehow I wound up in college. I wound up going to San Francisco State. and uh, I was an ethnic studies major. Um, I was studying to be an art teacher, but wound up <laughs> becoming a probation officer at Juvenile, where I used to get locked up. Don't ask. It just happened that way. I, I happened to um, start working for an agency called the Real Alternatives Program in the mission, and I uh, wound up learning about community organizing, and a lot of my experience through college working with community agencies, rather, I, I, I had a new perspective. Rather than fighting against each other, um, body of warfare and all that kind of stuff, I wound up learning to fight for each other and becoming a community advocate and learn how to organize. I became a member of La Raza Student Organization and our motto was to come back into the community and recruit uh, high-risk youth into college and get them in through the EOP program, which I'm an alumni of. Um, when I graduated with my bachelor's degree, there was an opening at the probation department, and at the time there was a, a woman who was the director of probation. Her name was Delba Chavez, who later went on to work with the Clinton administration. But at the time, uh, the probation department was filled with... Uh, the old guard, mostly old, white, Irish, Italian, German guys who would railroad Latino and brown kids on first offenses to youth authority, and other kids would get breaks. Um, so when I got recruited, she wanted somebody who was streetwise, had a degree and spoke Spanish. They had a consent decree, and I wound up walking in backwards. I got the job that I never in a million years thought I would be doing. And I worked there for 25 years. Throughout that time, um, I, I used my, my skills uh, as an artist and did some mural projects with youth. This mural here was originally painted in 1984. My mentor, Ray Patlan, who is a muralist from Chicago, he's also a Vietnam vet, moved to San Francisco in the 70s and started doing mural projects with youth. And I was my first year of college, I wound up coming to work with him by neighborhood at the Folsom Park area where there was a lot of drugs, gang violence, and um, a lot of riffraff. But I was from that neighborhood, so I was used as a liaison to get some of the homies to participate in mural projects for this agency called Youth Environment Study. This mural on 24th in York was originally titled Y Tu, Y Yo, Y Que. And the theme for that was um, images of snapshots of the neighborhood, merchants and residents, as a reflection of the neighborhood on this wall. That wall used to be a pharmacy, and we painted that in 1984. Um, during that time after that, we painted it. I became a probation officer. And by 1995, I was working a gang unit. I was... Um, working with a lot of high-risk kids also, that mural had faded and got weathered and eventually needed a restoration. So we got a grant from the mayor's office to restore the mural, and Ray Patlan gave me permission to redo the mural. I kept the theme, and I wound up working with the neighborhood gang, the York Street Mob. They're all Norteños. And uh, wound up working with those youth, and we tweaked the theme to uh, kept the title and kind of tweaked it to Itu, Io, y Cesar. In 1995, Cesar had 
passed away in 93. And so we wanted to dedicate the mural to his memory. And we also added cultural icons like Pancho Villa, Frida Kahlo, Malcolm X, Nelson Mandela, Native Americans. And then we put neighborhood folks into the, into the imagery of the mural. And um, <laughs> there's Nelson. Anyways, I'll let, I'll let the slideshow just go. But, oh, are you moving it for me? Okay, cool. So um, we, we restored the mural, and that's the way it looks now. In 95, it was a lot crisper and brighter and fresher. So that, those photos are recent photos of it. And uh, the theme of this show about murals being wiped out and um, taken, uh, just destroyed, uh, is probably going to happen to this one because the owner of the building bought the pharmacy, turned it into a coin-op laundromat, and now he wants, uh, he's applying for permits from the city to tear the building down and build uh, condos. And uh, so we're trying to block them. La Calle 24, Eric Arguello, and uh, people in the community have uh, gotten together to fight him on this at the city planning level. So we've been going to city planning meetings to kind of block them. And so we've actually gotten him to delay his uh, destruction of the building or the demolition because he doesn't have the permits and they haven't done all the surveys that need to be done. So we're kind of blocking them through the bureaucratic, pro bureaucratic process. So one thing that's different between LA and San Francisco, how their murals are being demolished and destroyed, San Francisco is a lot more organized because it's a tighter knit community the Mission District is a lot more organized and has a lot more people fighting for our rights as artists because murals that were funded by the mayor's office are technically protected from any type of destruction, and this is one of them. But um, the owner is fighting because he owns the building. And so um, if he does destroy the building and get his way, he's already... Uh, conceded to allowing me to paint a mural on the new building if it ever gets built. So that's one of the things that um, I wanted to talk about. Also, um, so, in order, so the community can be successful in fighting some of the stuff that's aimed at the arts. As far as the gentrification, it's something that, you know, for me, I've been a victim of it. I was born and raised in the mission as an adult. With my little family, we rented a two-bedroom on 20th and South Van Ness for $1,200. New owners bought it, raised the rent to $3,400. Since that time, I moved to South San Francisco, Millbrae. Now I'm living in San Bruno, and I got lucky. I have a really cool landlord. But um, it, that, that greed and that tech boom has really demolished our mission district. It's watered it down. So um, I'm hoping that you know, we can get loans to evict the evictors. So maybe we go to that same damn bank and get some money and evict those guys. But I doubt that can happen. But um, a little footnote, Alex, Alex Nieto, uh, the young man who was killed in Bernal Heights by the police, he was my intern. He was a college student at City College and he wanted to be a probation officer. I met him when he was in junior high school. Um, he lived upstairs from the Bernal Heights community center with his mom and dad who were pictured in, in uh, Carla's video. And um, since that time, he was always a good kid volunteering. And um, it's unfortunate that the gentrification that happened, he was walking on Bernal Heights Road, eating his burrito, getting ready to go to his job as a bouncer at El Toro nightclub on here on San Bruno Avenue. And he had his taser that he used for work, which one of the dog walkers confused for a gun and called the cops. The rest is history. They came and murdered him. Um, and so that's just a little side note. But, I mean, it, it is tragic and all these police killings, you know, it's pretty fishy how it happens where um, they're trying to get rid of us and get us out of the neighborhood and protect the people that are moving in. So... Hopefully we can come up with some solutions for this, <laughs> you know, but thank you. And I um, just want to share, give my testimony.
Tomas is going to close with his presentation, and then we're just going to take questions, I think, um, for the end of the event, and then stay and see the exhibition as well. So I'm going to hand it over to Tomas. I'm very thankful for all of you for staying and participating and asking questions. So very grateful for you all. Hi. Yeah, again, thank you, everyone who stayed uh, to, to the conclusion, and I really well you know, appreciate your listening. So I'm going to be as brief as possible just so that we can get on to the sort of exchange portion of the evening. Um, my presentation is not data-driven, so uh, I come to you representing three different um, sort of elements of my experience that have been affected and altered by gentrification in their own ways. Um, some of them personal, some of them professional, some of them political. So I begin with the personal. You know, I've always had a deep, deep connection ever since the day in 1914 that my grandfather was born at St. Luke's Hospital on Valencia Street with the city of San Francisco. And despite the fact that I spent most of my life Growing up in San Diego, um, I still consider myself very deep, deeply committed and uh, rooted in the Mission District of San Francisco. Um, all of that to say that, you know, with origins in the city, um, as was mentioned, I was uh, part of an artistic collective that did spoken word all over the country for, well, I guess we still do it off and on, but consistently for 10 years called the Taco Shop Poets. We were born in the San Diego neighborhood of Barrio Logan which has a lot of similarities to the Mission District of San Francisco and is rooted in um, the, the uh, park that was created in the year 1970, uh, known as Chicano Park, where some of the most um, famous murals in Chicano art movement, especially movement-oriented art, still exists today. And in my own way, was part of the protection movement um, as they were, they've been put under attack at various points since, like, since their creation in 1970 over the years. Some of them had to do with, um, I think we were all as community members a little confused by this about how to react because they are painted on overpass pillars, freeway overpass pillars most, for the most part. And there was a massive movement to retrofit all of the bridges in, uh, in well, throughout California. So the, there we were with this sort of moral dilemma, do we let them paint over the murals or do we protect the entire neighborhood from bridges that may collapse during an earthquake. So sometimes you find yourselves in these moral dilemmas around um, what's, what's, what's prioritized and, and our community's understanding of the role of art in the community in general is, is continually evolving. And all that to say that not only have I grown up around murals, but these are my sons hanging out at 24th Street, and they have as well, and I would just add into what's already been presented that I don't know that their experience in the city would be as rich and fulfilling as it has been if they hadn't been exposed to as much art and culture as we've tried to push on them. So this was actually taken on Thanksgiving Day. Um, it's one of our favorite days of the year, not because we you know, really appreciate Thanksgiving and it's, it's the work that it did to indigenous communities, but because the city is empty. And this is 24th Street Bart Plaza. My son got a new car and he got to turn the whole plaza into his own private racetrack. And it's become sort of an annual tradition for us to, to walk around and make them notice the murals that they walk past every day but don't see because there's so many people standing in between us and the things that we create sometimes. So this is on Valencia Street. It's my son working on a wheat paste mural for, um, it's, it's just taking shape so it's hard to see, but it was for uh, the students, the missing 43 students at Ayatsinopa. Ayatinapa, sorry. Um, which is to say that it's always been a priority for us to immerse uh, the young people that not only are part of our lives, but part of our communities in the, the rich cultural tradition of making the walls our canvases. Um, it's been part of my work ever since I started working in education, um, as well as uh, the uh, spoken word movement that is the phenomenon of You Speaks. When I first arrived back in San Francisco, I actually was a teacher at Cesar Chavez Elementary on Folsom Street. I thought I had a shot of that in there, but maybe I forgot. This is my family at 24th and Folsom, across the street from the mural that you were discussing earlier in your presentation. This is honoring, uh, well, this was also done by Presida Eyes, and it was honoring local poet, recently, uh, well, you know, recently passed away poet, um, uh, Carlos Texidor. Um, we took it to be cute in front of the word family, but just to, show, to testify to our uh, involvement in these kinds of activities around the city over time, 
There is um, a bay window, and if you look underneath the bay window, there is text, and the text comes from a poem written by my wife. So um, it was really, uh, really a moment of celebration for us to um, recognize the cultural contributions that we continue to make to the mural making movement and the arts making movement, even as, a, as the exhibit will testify, uh, continues to be erased. Still, even as late as 2013, we believed that there was a lot of love in this city despite the fact that we live very close to 25th and Valencia, which is, as I mentioned, ground zero uh, and perhaps the origin story of the tech bus. When it first pulled up on the very first day, we had no idea what it was. There were just a lot of 20-somethings standing, standing in line like school children on their smartphones waiting very patiently with a line around the corner we had uh, no idea what was coming. Um, so we endured this. And I actually witnessed the first uh, tech bus stoppage and celebrated with the protesters who stopped the bus. But still, you know, in, in our family and in our hearts, we still wanted to believe this in the sort of Anne Frank kind of way, that, that it wasn't all going to go wrong in the way that it has. Um, where was I going with that? Because, as was mentioned, not only have families been displaced, that I was mentioned that I was going to talk about something a little bit more professional, re, professional related. Um, I work in arts administration and was the former executive director of Counterpulse and learned a lot of, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the organization, so I'll just point out that it's an art space that now exists near the corner of Turk and Taylor um, in the Tenderloin. And at the moment we moved into that space, our concern was for uh, preserving this, this kind of feeling in the Tenderloin community in the same way that we feel it in the mission. Art organizations, as you may or may not know, have historically been um, accused, rightfully or wrongfully so, as gateway drugs toward gentrification. You bring an arts organization, and then any of you know the intersection of Turk and Taylor, to put an arts organization there um, was, I'd say, risky and in an innovative strategy at best. <laughs> um, so that was my concern from day one as someone who considers himself part of the cultural fabric of the city and, and, in, and in that way an arts activist about preserving what was good about the Tenderloin for the residents and not making, and not making my arts organization the agent of change that destroyed the neighborhood. Um, moving on. So ground, we mentioned my personal story of, I think it was actually 2016, uh, this was one of the, the uh, digital murals that they put on the side of Galleria de la Raza, um, sort of a death of the mission for Day of the Dead. Um, and at this, around this time was when we, we received the notice that uh, our landlord, who owns several properties around the city, and I don't need to mention him by name because um, I'm trying to move on. But the idea was that he owns several uh, properties around the city and was moving into our unit, or needed to move into our unit under the auspices of placing his son who needed a place to live because he was borderline autistic and they needed to get him closer to his brother. All of that also would pull at your heartstrings. The son of a landlord who has autism needs a place to stay that, because his brother lives upstairs. Sure, I had, even in my shock and anger, a certain amount of sympathy for the landlord situation. I mean, it wasn't a lot, but like a certain amount of sympathy. And I just want to tell you about the details of our case just to um, share how uh, the resources that may be on the handouts that are presented for you, were, how we were able to take advantage of those and leverage, um, I think, some part of the unique place that, that our family maintains in the community as culturally connected, culturally aware, politically aware um, in the way that, you know, some of the other um, newcomer residents um, and immigrant residents may not be. So well, this, this was day one. We got the notice. What we do immediately is go to the San Francisco Tenants Union, start um, our investigation through the drop-in services, that unto itself is a challenge to navigate, and I couldn't imagine if we weren't as prepared for the conversation as we were, that it might have been a much more difficult process because it's very intricate, the, the language of an eviction notice. Um, and they were 
uh, helpful in, in, in assisting with the translation of the document, but the resources that we were able to receive from them were also very limited in that it was just a drop-in service, and so we weren't sure what our next move was going to be. So this is connected to my story with working in, at CounterPulse because had I not had two years, two and a half years of working experience in the Tenderloin, I would have never heard of the Tenderloin Housing Clinic, right? Tenderloin Housing Clinic provides free legal services for tenants who are, uh, have been issued eviction notices. So the one thing that they advised us to do, it was a really kind of, at looking back on it, almost funny summer, because one of the protections that we, um, that we received as parents and families in the city of San Francisco is they can't evict, they can't evict you during the school year if you have children enrol enrolled in San Francisco Unified. So we received our notice in like early April, probably the last day of March, which meant that it coincided with the eight weeks left of the school year. So we knew we had eight years to strategize, and that, I mean eight years, eight weeks to strategize, and this is, again, even that slip of the tongue kind of reveals the state of confusion we were in because we've been in our apartment for nearly 20 years. We were... Um, grateful to have had sort of an anchor tenant. My wife's uncle lived in the unit before us and then kind of gifted it to her. And we had a great relationship with the previous landlord, but the, you know, the, the newer uh, property owners have not been as uh, cooperative. Um, before I get to that, so I wouldn't have known about the Tenderloin Housing Clinic. The things that they advised us on immediately were to, to leverage our status as cultural producers, as you know, we're artists known in the community and, and uh, read very poetry very frequently um, in most of the community venues. And so they said, you need to leverage that. You are an executive director in, this, in the Tenderloin and you're doing awesome work and who wouldn't feel um, the, the passion of someone who really wants to stay in the city? You're both community-based artists, you have family. And so that, all that to say that our story they felt was very compelling and that we needed to go public. So they produced this. Mission District Poet Theater Director Face Sham OMI eviction in the Beyond Cron website. And the, you know, that's not a mu mission mural, that's actually in North Beach, but it looks like one. It looks like one. So it, we didn't stage the photograph, we actually took that picture um, in uh, Kerouac Alley, uh, probably about a year before the events you know, got underway. Um, so, I think long story short, just to get us back to the discussion component of the evening, um, we got issued our eviction. We knew we had eight weeks to plan. The timing of the eviction um, provided six weeks between the last day of school in the school year and the ultimated, ultimatum date for us to respond to the eviction. And the Lawyer's advice, he's a very clever guy. Um, the lawyer's advice was, I think you should do your best to like not be home for those six weeks. So as soon as school let out, we went on a series of staycations um, that ironically led us to uh, the homes of displaced folks in Sausalito, folks that used to live in the mission and now own homes in Sausalito and Oakland Hills. And so for us it was like, you know, moving on up. We got to stay on a houseboat and stay in the Oakland Hills. But it was still a series of just like, pack your whole family up. You guys have our house sit for a week. And so we basically just dodged the landlord for six weeks until it was too late for him to physically hand us the paperwork. And once that happened, our lawyer moved in and said, you know, this is flawed anyway. And we eventually won the case. So what that, how that relates to, yeah, we're thankfully still in the same apartment, um, and I still get to watch the buses line up like school children. And so if they're orderly lines, they're better than children, actually, because I used to teach the fourth grade. Um, so the last thing I'll say is the way that this is connected to my professional life is that the story of Counterpulse, and I'll tell this as quickly as possible just because uh, I think it can be told quickly. So the transformation of downtown the area in San Francisco is just as rampant as what's going on in the mission. If you haven't seen Central Market in the last, like two years ago to now, it's a, it's a totally different world. Um, so we, uh, Counterpost used to live at Ninth and Mission and had a lease there for 10 years. As you know, that was uh, where 
sort of catty corner from where Twitter just created their headquarters. And as their lease was about to expire, our landlord let us know that, you know, we really need to revisit the market value of your location. Um, basically, you guys are going to, got to move. Your rent's going to triple and you need to be looking for another space. So we entered into a conversation with the Northern California Community Loan Fund, um, which is basically a, what would you call it, socially conscious bank. Um, that assists nonprofits with these kinds of situations. And they were trying to help us find a space. Um, ultimately, the Rainin Foundation, located in the East Bay, uh, swooped in, parachuted in with $5.3 million to create a new organization that now is called the Community Arts Stabilization Trust. Because just as families are being dis displaced, uh, small and mid-sized arts organizations are also being displaced as leases expire. And, and uh, I think that's related to the exhibit that we're looking at and also to the cultural values of the city as it turns its attention toward development and progress over cultural preservation and um, perhaps the activities that make us most human and make us want to live here in San Francisco in the first place. So what actually happened was through that process we were able to acquire a space on Taylor Street um, which was an abandoned formerly adult cinema that we then uh, renovated into a 10,000 square foot art space that exists today. You can't miss it. It's a big pink building with a neon sign um, right next to uh, what's about to be the 950 Market Project, which is a 250 uh, room hotel meets 248 unit condominium complex. So even as we fought to preserve the cultural space that was Turk Street, um, there's still yet to come. And I used to tell the residents that became the people that I saw every day. You have no idea what's coming, but you better look for it. Look for it. Don't wait for it. We're going to take questions now, and then you can call out questions. So. I have a question, and I also have a lot to say, so I'm going to apologize in advance. Um, Do you, can you just get up to the Oh, God. Okay. No, I'm just <laughs> So I moved here about two months ago. Um, long story short, I've moved around a lot. San Francisco is, and I've lived in, I lived in Columbia, I've lived in I blink towns in Pennsylvania, and I guess my first question is, as somebody who is new to the Bay Area, this is the first place that I've ever actually thought about what a community is, and where I've, for, like, this is the first time I've ever actually cared about getting involved with a community, and so as somebody who's not from here, how do I get involved without contributing to the problem, right? Because I moved out here, I got a tech job, now I live here. How do I not become part of the problem? Where do you live? I live in Potrero Hill. Well, I, I just want to open, I, I don't have an answer, but I just want to open by saying that I think, um, it, for me it's important for all of us to realize that there's no a pure space. Everybody's, it, we're all intertwined in a system and everybody's a part of it in one way or another. Um, not to say that, so the, the fact that you're aware of it and, and reflective and, and searching for answers I think is probably the most important thing. Yeah, I, I think that's my response as well. The fact that you're here and part of this conversation uh, demonstrates an awareness that a lot of folks just don't have yet. So even in your first few months, you've gotten off to the right, on the, on the right foot. Um, and I think it's just important to continue to support the, the cultural institutions that you know, value the kinds of work that I've heard around this table. Or, or if art is not your thing, you know, the social service institutions are always looking for volunteerism. You know, if there's a way of engaging, even as a newcomer to the city, that is more authentic and genuine than, um, than what we've seen from the worst examples. Um, right. Uh, where, where in Petra do you live? There's uh, a community center called Petra Hill Community Center. It does a lot of work with youth and uh, social services with youth. Um, if your interests are working with young people, a lot of people that go to that center, given the Petrillo projects, 
which are slated for demolition to build that thing. But there's still a lot of people fighting that. And um, that's one of the biggest housing projects in San Francisco. Uh, if you live near the projects, they're like a, alongside the same for 280. Um, um, so if you live anywhere between Cesar Chavez all the way up to 20th and on the side of the hill, I mean, it's, it's walking distance from... I, I walk past it every day. So you can check out the... the, the I mean, I, I've been retired three years, but I worked a lot and made a lot of referrals to the program. I don't know if some of the people that are still there are there, uh, but they do a lot of advocacy work for youth. And that would be one way of getting involved in the community and, and just being part of the community. And you'll see where you fit in. Thank you. I would echo that, like, there's no, there's no cure for me in any of this, right? But um, two things that I try to pay a lot of attention to and ask others to is, like, pay a lot of attention to where you put your money. So if you can not go to the Starbucks on the corner, but go to, or the Blue Bottle or whatever is the $6 coffee, but, like, find the mom and pop place that has been there for forever and put your money there, like, is real investment of taking those tech dollars okay. and putting them into helping people stay in that neighborhood. Um, and the other is that being new is a great excuse to actually meet your neighbors. One of the folks in the, um, in the video was talking about like how they used to, when somebody moved in, they used to have a big party and like welcome them and get to know each no, other. No, they talk to me. <laughs> I, well, I'm annoying, so I'm just persistent with my neighbors. So I will like go and knock on their door and bring them food. <laughs> I do, I show up. <laughs> I show up with food when I move into a new place. Um, but you will find who those people are who want to put those roots out. Right. Um, and a lot of neighborhoods, I don't know if I'm sure about, but a lot of neighborhoods have an emergency preparedness council mm -hmm. that ends up being a place where some of this can happen. Because um, folks will go in on like a shared water supply for when the earthquake happens. And that's a way to at least like start conversation. Yeah. Can I add one thing? I know I'm not on the panel, but um, there is a lot of um, work being done where people are trying to be socially responsible mm -hmm. as um, employers. Mm -hmm. So finding out like your internal affinity groups um, and bringing this up. Because a lot right. of times they find these sexy causes to back behind and don't think about how to really, really be grassroots and um, uh, know the neighborhoods that they're impacting. So you could be the catalyst for that change by bringing up um, subject matter that may not already be on their radar. Mm -hmm. And again, with moving money, if your tech company has a donor match, really working mm -hmm. that, or if your friends are all at Google or Facebook or wherever, they have donor matches. I don't have friends yet, but I'm going to make friends with those people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. cool. I, have, I have more questions if nobody has questions. There's a question over there. Way over here. Yeah, um, I'm wondering if... Um, there's, there's a group or a person or an organization that has a list of all the murals in town. Um, because I, I keep running in these places. I used to sub in schools for a while. And some of the school has had these sort of weather beaten murals that, that were really good, but I had never heard of. Didn't know anything about it. There was one at a school in Biz Valley. And it's a labor thing here and here. But I just keep running, running in, in the here and there will Billy. So I'm wondering if uh, there was someone or something that's kind of track of what's around, what needs to be restored, what needs to be painted over, over because some of them aren't really all that great. But um, <laughs> so well, uh, Presida Eyes Mural Art Center has been around for 41 years, right. and it's located on 24th and Harrison. Mm -hmm. And we do mural education, we paint murals, we do community murals, we do restoration. Um, we would never paint out a mural because we, there's plenty of walls for the murals. But um, yeah, we do mural tours. I'm there Wednesday through Saturday. So they know where every year you no. is in San Francisco? No. Uh, most of But yeah, I think wow. they know most of that. Okay. Right. Yeah. And they have a website. You can look them up. Proceed to Eyes for Real Eyes. Mm -hmm. Certainly the one.
know that they've worked on. Right? Yeah. I'm sure through that you could identify probably in your own. Oh, okay. Like through some connection. I was just wondering, um, I, I, I like the story that you were telling about with the um, laundry mat and you kind of, you know, worked it out finally with the owner to actually, you know, allow the mural to go back, you know, with, with the building. So a couple things, I'm wondering, you know, you're working with the, the real estate the builder, you know, developer community, you know, as they go to build these buildings, say, hey, you want to come in first, we don't want to hold up your process because that's what they're really sensitive to process gets dragged on and on, which raises the price of the rental unit or the condo, whatever you're selling, even further, you know, work with them, you know, proactively and say, hey, and then, and then get some funding, let's say, from the, uh, uh, the tourism bureau. Because I know we have, we've had a lot of visitors come out of town and say, oh, we want to, we want to see the painted ladies, and we drive them up to, uh, what's it, the, up to Alamo Park and say, no. We're talking about mission murals, so so there's a lot of interest among tourists, especially foreign tourists, about that. So you know the uh, you know the tourism bureau is aware of that. Then maybe you know we can get some funding and you know have a win-win situation between the community and, and the, the builders and, and 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 youth. The tourism bureau are, are they uh, part of SF Travel? SF. Uh, so we could, we could actually contact them and, and see how we could connect. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. I mean, I think they have an office used to be under the Powell Park Station. I would reaching out to them and see what... Um, yeah, you know, see if they have funding. Because they're definitely, you know, it's a tourist draw. When you start asking for money, they might say, oh, uh... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm writing grants somewhere else. But, but yeah. I, well, I mean, every time a tourist comes there, the thing, you know, they'll stay in a hotel and get help tax. Okay, thank you. I would add on to that, too, that in terms of public agencies that are, kind of city agencies that are really supportive of public art, that the Mayor's Office of Economic Workforce Development is really interested in projects that tie together community revitalization and um, particularly arts-based um, just public art projects that are community inclusive. Um, and I think they recently, well not recently, but like within the last year or so, they actually created a public office position that is led, who's, who's charged with leading the effort to preserve art spaces and public art projects. So at least there's progress on that front under this administration. I hope that continues. So my, my other question is how, so an issue that I'm really passionate about is, is literacy, right? Because we have a 14% functional liter illiteracy rate in the US, which means that seven out of 50 adults can't read an article for comprehension, but it's really hard to get 30 plus year old people to admit that they can't read. And so that's an issue that I face. And so how do you educate the people who are either facing eviction and are completely unaware, like you mentioned, of the resources that are there, and alternatively, how do I educate big tech companies like Facebook who, in a blissful universe, are just unaware of the impact that they're having on the local community? So how do I, is there, is there a place that I can sign up to just go to Facebook and call them once a week and be like, hi, you're blah, 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 gentrification? Or how, how, how can I educate the people that need to be educated about what they're doing or where they can go to not have this happen to them? create this like faux, so the model that you're talking about, about literacy, and, mm -hmm. and if like literacy is an important skill, but that, that whole thing is under sort of like a deficit model, of, right. right? So you take that and then you get all this data about only 10% only of tech workers have literacy about what their impact is. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
and then you create a campaign to increase literacy of the, the, the poor tech workers who don't know how to read yeah. their community. I like that. I like that. <laughs> you can take yeah. that step further and you can say. about tech bros is they're usually like kind of in shock when they talk to a pretty girl so you can get all kinds of information out of them <laughs> and they don't even know. <laughs> they have no idea. It's great. All right. <laughs> so I think that might be the end of our Q&A but stay. So the exhibit has more wine, eat a snack, you deserve it. Thank you for staying. I appreciate it.